Good morning and welcome to a uh, joint hearing between the House and Senate Judiciary Committees and we are continuing our discussion on H317, um, an act relating to establishing the Bureau of Racial Justice uh, Statistics. And I am going to um, turn this meeting over to Representative Kevin Coach Christie, who has really been taking the, the lead on this bill, which I very much appreciate. So, uh, good morning, Coach. Good morning, Representative Grad, Madam Chair, and uh, welcome to our uh, our colleagues uh, from the Senate. And it's always great to see you, my friends. Um, and happy birthday to uh, Chair Sears again. Thank you, Coach. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we had talked about uh, April being uh, uh, a big month in the uh, legislature for uh, birthdays. Uh, there's a number of us that uh, share April as that happy month. Uh, to move into our discussion, uh, I will be asking uh, for a screen share uh, just briefly uh, to kind of set the context uh, of, of our discussion. So if I can get uh, Evan to allow me to do that. What I'd like to share with you is, and for some it might seem Okay, come on. You gotta love it. You know, you, you test all of this stuff, you know, beforehand and you just go, okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, let's make sure it's working. <laughs> so what we will do is you'll notice that, let me get it to move right. There we go. Um, the red box in the middle uh, is uh, the jumping off point for our discussion. Um, uh, both the House and the Senate uh, had a uh, bill that looked at setting up a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics uh, and a bureau um, uh, also comprised of an advisory panel that would support uh, that bureau. And as the uh, Senate uh, shared uh, their bill, uh, S-108, which was a mirror image of the House Bill 317, uh, our two chairs uh, decided to uh, have the House uh, take the first run you know, at the bill. And that's what we're doing uh, at this point. Um, you know, we haven't taken uh, formal testimony uh, as yet around the um, this uh, amendment uh, that uh, Eric will uh, detail for us. Uh, but I wanted to share some of the thinking. Uh, as you can see, uh, when we look at uh, the the boxes to the right. Uh, there's been a lot of recommendations and discussion. Um, you know, we looked at um, Judge Grierson, uh, Representative Rachelson, uh, and others uh, strongly recommended uh, that the Bureau uh, reside uh, in the Office of Racial Equity. Um, there were some, uh, including Representative uh, Colburn, uh, that uh, suggested that it might be a good fit in the Human Rights Commission. And then there were uh, a number of folks that thought that maybe uh, under the agency uh, of administration and the agency of digital services, um, and then as you go through the testimony that we uh, heard, um, you know, we see that RDAP um, came back with 
uh, eight prior, you know, eight possible uh, options over on on the left, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Nazreddin Longo uh, presented those to our committee. Uh, they included under the Office of Racial Equity, the Agency of Digital Services, a standalone body, the legislature's Joint Fiscal Office, Vermont Secretary of State's Office, the Office of the Auditor, the Human Rights Commission, and then the National Center for Restorative Justice. So listening to the testimony, um, uh, Professor Sand uh, came and uh, offered, you know, like his thoughts. Uh, and as you all know, um, uh, he's a Vermont Law School professor, you know, past state's attorney, uh, and also uh, the originator, uh, founder of the uh, National Center for Restorative Justice. Uh, and we also heard uh, a very uh, uh, strong uh, presentation from uh, Attorney uh, Turner uh, from the Defender General's office, but in her capacity as a, a RDAP member, uh, looking at um, you know three of her strongest thoughts being the Secretary of State, the Human Rights Commission, the National Center, and then possibly um, the agency looking at independence. So continuing, uh, you can see where coming out of um, S-108 and 318, uh, the box on the left, and if I can get my cursor, uh, this box here, uh, it gives you a little uh, uh, explanation of what we were looking at as far as uh, staff. So, you know, one full-time exempt executive director, you know, who shall, um, uh, be an information technology uh, data person. Uh, and then two full-time exempt uh, data analysts and one full-time classified administrative assistant. You know, that would be the, uh, let's say the working uh, body uh, of the group. Some, some of the, um, the existing work that we're, we've all been involved with uh, because of our committees and uh, the statutes that we've been working on. Uh, as we go um, off to the left uh, of, that, of that box, and I'm gonna make this a little smaller so we can get everything on the screen. Uh, this, this area here, you know, speaks to, you know, the Criminal Justice Training Council, uh, Justice Reinvestment, uh, the, uh, the supporting uh, legislation, you know, within uh, the jurisdiction, you know, of the council, and then the work that the Council of State Governments uh, have been doing uh, regarding uh, reinvestment. Uh, and I think their contract, as I recall in uh, some of the testimony, uh, is coming to a close uh, after within a year, I think. Um, what we did uh, in this in this map too, there's links to supporting uh, the supporting subchapters uh, that look at some of the uh, areas 
that are jurisdictional uh, to the to the council. And the reason that I highlighted these is they're the areas that RDAP have been talking about in their data gathering. Uh, and in addition to the data, what I found interesting in evaluating some of the uh, uh, the underlying uh, statutes is there's a lot of oversight uh, within the capability or ability that we've empowered uh, the Criminal Justice Training Council and its executive director. And in some cases, uh, it hasn't been used uh, the way we would hope uh, over time. And, you know, we can talk about that uh, at another time. Uh, but uh, the data input points that go along with the training and legislation most recently passed uh, around use of force are all, uh, let's say, couched uh, within this area of jurisdiction. And it's interesting that um, the power uh, for um, oversight is also there. Um, as we as we look at this area, the green the green panel. This actually starts to talk about uh, the amendment uh, to uh, 317. And what I'm suggesting is, is that the Bureau, at least at this point in time, be stood up under RDAP. And the reason for that you know, being that the work of RDAP is directly related to the concept of the Bureau. Uh, and some of the, um, uh, the formulation, you know, of that, when RDAP did its report, uh, they had a subcommittee uh, of their panel, uh, which convened more regularly than the actual RDAP committee itself. And it worked very, very well. Uh, and uh, they were able to execute uh, a very strong document. So taking that into account, uh, what we would be looking at is RDAP uh, would take uh, the leadership, you know, of standing up the Bureau, uh, a subcommittee uh, of RDAP would actually act as the panel for the Bureau. And within that context, we have a number of our colleagues that sit on that panel that I guess I'll refer to them as data geeks. Uh, they, <laughs> I, I, I see, uh, you know, the doctor smiling over there. Uh, so, uh, and that's an indication uh, of, of their interest in that. Uh, and, and that group would, would take that. So what we would also do is move the supports over to RDAP to allow for uh, the implementation you know, of the Bureau. So we would hire uh, a director slash administrator uh, that would take the coordinating uh, role uh, for the Bureau. 
Uh, we would also hire uh, an administrative uh, support person that would take a dual role, uh, not only supporting the, uh, the director, but also adding uh, direct supports to RDAP, uh, which uh, would be in addition to um, what the, uh, uh, the AG's office uh, uh, has been uh, offering uh, since its inception. Uh, you'll notice the, the fourth box says, add the Office of Racial Equity uh, to RDAP. Well, when we created RDAP, the Office of Racial Equity was not in existence. Even though you see the office participating uh, in RDAP on a regular basis, the office does not have a vote. So what would occur in you know this model uh, would be that the office would have a vote. And what I'd like to also suggest, and this isn't in the um, um, in the draft presently, but that we add two additional members to RDAP that would be selected by the Office of Racial Equity with expressed interest and background, not only as BIPOC members of the Vermont community, but with an interest in data or a background in data uh, in that selection. Uh, and, you know, here's, here's where uh, we get to something that RDAP has done very, very well, which is collaboration. Uh, it, it works uh, functionally um, very well you know, considering the number of people uh, that uh, 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 Dr. Eton has to deal with, um, they they play well in the sandbox. You know, most of the time, at, at least. Uh, <laughs> and, and I see the nod, so I I I think my observation is is reasonably accurate. So what we would be looking at is creating this collaborative of Vermont data specialists. And it could include such members as the chief performance officer uh, that presently does all of the performance data gathering for the state of Vermont. You know, we would also look to the National Center for Restorative Justice for supports. We would look also to, and, and we wouldn't name these folks in the bill because we don't name individuals, but we have some key uh, data uh, providers and specialists that have been doing some great work for the state, um, you know, such as, you know, our, our CRG and Dr. Sequeno and Pat Attilio. And we'd be looking to, you know, that group to actually do our gathering and analysis along with our director uh, of the Bureau. And then in talking with the Council of State Governance, uh, governments, uh, they've also offered their assistance uh, in uh, the continuing development, you know, of this uh, project. Now, um, before we have um, Eric uh, walk us through the draft of the bill. Um, this is a divergence from a lot of the 
um, the testimony that that we took as far as uh, folks looking to um, you know where the bureau would be housed at present and the interesting thing you know is the thinking seemed to lean towards the office of the direct director of racial equity the my thinking about not doing that at this point at least is we've tasked that office in almost every single piece of legislation we've passed in the last two years to do work. Now we finally, as a body, given that office supports so that it could do its work, but this is the first time that the office will have those supports at hand. So putting that office under more duress, so to speak, by moving the bureau or starting the bureau there um, would not be a, an effective use uh, of energy. Uh, if anything, you know, it's the potential for imploding uh, would be fairly high, I think. Um, so, as you can see, there's a lot of interfacing that's going on uh, in this model. And what it does is it leaves the opportunity for growth and change. So as the office gains its strength, it would be uh, reasonably easy for us as the policy makers to make any, uh, let's say, adaptations that we need to at a later point. So that's my thinking. That's what's been going on in my head. It's a very strange place to be and to go. My wife always says that. <laughs> you wouldn't want to go in there. <laughs> it's a scary place. Uh, but I, I really appreciate the opportunity and I'm humbled by uh, uh, being offered uh, this chance to work uh, for our chairs, uh, Ch Senator Sears and Representative Grad, and thank you for this opportunity. So I'd like to uh, shift the floor over to our Ledge Council. Thank you. Get out of here. Thank you very much, Coach. This is really helpful to me. And uh, I, unfortunately, the Judiciary Committee, Senate Judiciary, will have to leave at 11. I don't want to leave anything, any stones unturned, but um, as three members of Senate Judiciary are on the Senate Appropriations Committee, we will be concerned about how to get something in the budget for FY22. And I hope you're working with your House counterparts on appropriations. With that, Morning, Thank Eric. You. Morning. Uh, so should I uh, proceed right to a quick walkthrough of the, of the language? That makes sense for everybody? Yes, thank you. Yes. Sure. OK, so Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to uh, walk the committee through Representative Christie's proposed amendment to H317, the act relating to establishing the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics. I'm also going to share a document, share the amendment. I think that would be helpful to take a quick look at it. But before I do, I'll just reiterate what Representative Christie said. And he, he gave a big, uh, very helpful and uh, description of what the proposal is here. So in a sense, this is just going to be taking a quick look at the language that um, 
puts on paper what you just heard already. And that is essentially, you remember that in the bill and the companion bill in the Senate as well, and the bill as introduced, the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics uh, was uh, housed alongside the uh, Office and Director of Racial Equity uh, within the agency of administration. So that's where, that's where it was in the bill as introduced. Uh, in this proposal, rather than be within the agency of administration, the idea is that the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics would be housed within and governed by uh, the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice systems advisory panel, which I'll refer to as RDAP. Um, so it would be housed, supervised, housed within, supervised by RDAP. And you may recall that also in the bill as introduced, uh, the Bureau was overseen by uh, an advisory panel in the same way uh, uh, that it works under under the agency of administration now. Uh, but the new proposal was that rather than there be a separate panel that oversees the Bureau, it would be overseen by a subcommittee that is established within RDAP. So that's the, that's the main uh, structural shift between the bill as introduced and, and the amendment you're looking at now. So the Bureau, no longer in the agency of administration, would be housed within governed by RDAP. There would not be a separate advisory panel uh, in, a separate one that needed to be established, but rather it would be a subcommittee that would be established within RDAP that would have the same role. And when we look at the, the same role as the advisory panel in the bill as introduced, I should say. Uh, but when we look at the language, you'll see that the substantive work of both the Bureau and this sort of advisory body um, is the same. There's no changes to the substantive data that, it, that the Bureau gathers, no change to the types of data, no change to the sort of interrelationship between the Bureau, and in this case, a subcommittee of RDAP, uh, but what had been an advisory panel, there's still this back and forth uh, relationship between those bodies and they're still reporting to the legislature. So those substantive pieces uh, are all uh, virtually identical. It's just the structural uh, place that the, that the Bureau sits that has changed. So having said that, I'll just uh, walk the committee through the language real quick so you can see the changes that are made. Um, I'm going to share the, the bill and I'll pull that right up for you. So here is uh, the Representative Christie's proposed amendment to H317. Please, uh, I'm assuming everybody can see it, but let me know if you can't. So you'll see that right away, and again, yellow highlighting is used to show the change between the bill as introduced and the amendment uh, that you're looking at now. So all, all, all the language related to the Bureau being in alongside the uh, racial equity office in the agency of administration is all struck. You see that. So as you see in line 13, it's not within the executive branch uh, under the agency of administration. Instead, as you can see in the new lines 15 through 17, uh, the Bureau is organized within governed by RDAP. So that's where uh, the Bureau is relocated to essentially uh, in this proposal. And you'll see that uh, this is the other point that Representative Christie was making is that so rather than the Bureau essentially employing several uh, IT specialists to collect the data on systemic racial bias and disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice systems, rather than the Bureau uh, with its own staff collecting that data itself, uh, the idea is to have the Bureau rely on and collaborate with the entities that already collect that data. So that's what you see is going on in subdivision two here. So uh, and it specifically lays out that uh, for purposes of collecting data related to the systemic bias, the Bureau facilitates collaboration. That's line three. So it's a different function rather than uh, collecting the data itself, it facilitates collaboration for purposes of collecting this data amongst, uh, and then you see some listed entities that Representative Christie had mentioned as well, uh, Vermont Crime Research Group, the Chief Performance Officer, Chief Data Officer, National Center for Restorative Justice, UVM, and uh, there's some catch-all language as well that any other entity that would be of assistance to the Bureau as well. And so the Bureau, you see in lines 10, 11, they, they coordinate the collaboration between these entities uh, for purposes of collecting the data. So they're not, in other words, as I mentioned, collecting it themselves. They coordinate the collection amongst these entities that already do it. Uh, and you'll see 
this uh, language here is unchanged as I'm moving further down the page. And this is because this is the substantive data that they coordinate the collection of. So as I mentioned, there is no change to the substantive types of data that's be, that are being collected. It's just uh, sort of how it's being uh, collected and organized. So um, Bureau coordinates all these entities listed here for purposes of this collection. And this first, you may remember from the previous walk through the bill, this is all data related to juvenile, the juvenile justice system. No changes to any of that types of data. I'm not gonna go through it again. We've, we've gone through this a couple of times. Um, same thing with sub D here. This is the adult criminal justice system. Same exact same language that you just saw rather than the Bureau. If you sort of look at line 16 and 17, if you imagine the highlighted language not being there, the way the bill read as introduced was the Bureau shall collect. Remember it went right from the Bureau shall to line 17, collect the following data. So the Bureau isn't doing the collecting under this proposal. The Bureau is coordinating, coordinating uh, the collection through the collaboration of those identity, those entities uh, that we just looked at, uh, as well as any other entities that the Bureau might find useful for that purpose. So they, they coordinate the collection by those other entities, but the, the substantive data is the same. See, so there's no changes here. Again, this is the adult criminal data system, no changes to any of that. It's just how it's being collected. And then some of the other bureaus responsibilities substantively also remain the same uh, other than data collection, uh, but they do these, uh, they perform these duties in consultation with, this is line 16 and 17. So the bureau, not, not necessarily on its own, but in consultation with those other entities, um, they analyze the data. That's basically what's going on here. Analyze the data in order to, you know, identify stages of the uh, criminal and justice system where racial and dis racial bias and disparities are most likely to occur, organize and synth synthesize the data in the cohesive and logical manner so that it can be best presented and understood. So again, those, those, there's no changes to those uh, duties of the Bureau. It's just that rather than do that uh, on their own, since they're obviously not gonna have as much staff, they do it in consultation with these other entities. Same thing with uh, the other uh, requirements that the Bureau has under subsection F. They do it in consultation with those entities. They develop the standardized data system. Uh, they develop, they propose methods to permit sharing and communication of the data among state and local agencies, other departments that collect it. And they recommend evidence-based practices and standards for collection and retention of the data. They have to maintain, a, no changes to that, by the way, you'll see they, the public facing website, they still maintain no changes to that. Now their reporting is obviously gonna be a little bit different because uh, as I mentioned, the oversight is a little different. There's not this separate panel, rather it's a subcommittee within uh, RDAP and that's what's identified here. So uh, they do a monthly report starting in December. Uh, they report its data analyses and recommendations, not to the panel, you see that struck through on line 17, but rather the report is made to the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Subcommittee uh, established uh, by the section we're going to look at within RDAP. So the subcommittee in RDAP is the one who receives these monthly reports from the Bureau. And then uh, uh, the Bureau does not report directly to the legislature. That's struck through on the top of page eight. Rather, it's going to be the subcommittee within RDAP that does the reporting. But then you'll see a lot of struck language because this is this, this advisory panel that was in the the bill as introduced, the separate advisory panel that oversee, oversaw the Bureau, that doesn't exist in this draft, rather it's going to be within RDAP. So there's gonna, rather than have this entirely new section, you just, the proposal is to make some amendments to the RDAP statute, which is, you'll see line three, it's just uh, title three, section 168. Uh, the first one actually is the one that uh, Representative Christie mentioned, uh, the other distinct item you'll see on line 13 that RDAP is proposed uh, to increase in size by one member. And that member is, you'll see on line seven of page 12, the executive director of racial equity, uh, a position that didn't exist when RDAP was first created. So it wasn't in there at the time. So the proposal was to add that member um, uh, to RDAP. And then you get to uh, the, and no changes to any of the other parts of the RDAP, the existing RDAP statute, but then uh, you- Eric, quick uh, comment, if you don't yes, mind. Yes, please. Um, yeah, go ahead. When you added the new member, you didn't put as 
or designee like we've done for everyone else. Um, I, I don't know if there's a reason for that, um, for the executive, the director of racial disparities, uh, racial equity, I mean, um, but given that we're adding people to her staff, that was, I don't know if it shouldn't be or designate. Yeah, that's a good point. I just wasn't, hadn't been sure whether or not there were enough other potential designees. So I wasn't sure whether to put it, but you're right. If the staff is bigger, it makes even more sense to and probably look, have that It stands option. out when we've got all these other people who right. have a designee. It, th that makes sense, you know, as it's growing, the office. That makes sense. I'm just noting that. Um, so, uh, right, so um, put that in for next draft. And the last piece though of the, well, the next piece regarding the um, RDAP panel is to, again, as I mentioned, uh, specifically provide that the, that the uh, RDAP is going to establish, and this is line 18, establish a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics subcommittee. So this is the, the uh, entity that oversees the Bureau, uh, but rather than being the separate advisory panel, the entity is, uh, is a subcommittee of RDA. The duties and responsibilities of this, uh, of its oversight are, are unchanged. You see, it's just the fact that it's a, a different body, um, but it specifically provides that the subcommittee is gonna have be, consist of five panel members. So in other words, it's five members of the RDAP panel who are selected by the chair with the advice and consent of the panel. So the concept is that there's consent amongst the panel as to which five members should be on the subcommittee. So uh, subcommittee, as I mentioned, the, the duties and responsibilities are exactly the same as, as what they were for the panel in the previous draft. They work with uh, the executive director of the Bureau of, of Racial Justice Statistics to implement their statutory requirements. They advise the executive director uh, they evaluate the data and analysis that they receive from the Bureau and they make recommendations to the Bureau as a result of those evaluations. So you have this back and forth relationship that they're looking at the data, giving the, the Bureau and the executive director advice as to how to best uh, implement the policies, how, how to respond to the data. It it's certainly envisions, a, a, as I mentioned, a, a reciprocity of a relationship between the, the subcommittee and the and the bureau, and then uh, it's the it's the subcommittee that we see in line eleven that does the annual reporting to the legislature, to the House and Senate committees on judiciary and on gov government operations. And these reports substantively have not been changed from what the panel would have done in the previous draft. They the reports have to include uh, findings on the systemic racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice systems that are based upon the data and analysis that the subcommittee got from the Bureau. So they, in other words, there's that analysis of the data so that they can extrapolate findings from the data and report them uh, to the legislature. They also would include a status report on the progress made and recommendations for further action to address systemic racial bias. Uh, so that sort of this ongoing analysis and oversight of the topic. And that's the, uh, end of what the, what the uh, subcommittee does, its responsibilities. Again, that the change also necessitated some changes in uh, positions being created and uh, the appropriation, which is still uh, waiting to hear anything specific about that. But with respect to the positions, you'll see that um, the, the new permanent positions are created uh, in the bureau, which is, and this is lines three and four, within the within RDAP. So that's where these positions are. They're in the bureau within RDAP. Uh, but since the uh, since the collection of data is now being done by the other bodies, that the the collaboration facilitated by the bureau rather than the bureau collecting the data itself, you don't need the those two full time IT data analysts to do that uh, collection because uh, but the Bureau's responsibilities are different. They're facilitating the collection by those other groups that are already doing it. So you still have the full-time executive director, lines five and six, that doesn't change. But the two full-time IT staff are struck 
you keep the one full-time administrative assistant, so you'd have two people instead of four. Um, and as I mentioned in the appropriation, and haven't heard a specific number yet as to what that would be, but obviously going to be substantially less because of the uh, removal of the two full-time IT positions. So, but I'll be able to update that number shortly. Um, and that brings us to to the end of the walkthrough. That's the the gist of it. Um, I can pull the document down or answer questions, whatever or uh, whatever the committee's pleasure is. Ma Senator Madam White. and Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, may I um, throw or something vice in person. There? Yes, Senator White. <laughs> so as you probably know, I also uh, am on government operations and chair that committee. And we, I, I hate to throw a monkey wrench in here, but we've been talking a lot about the gathering of statistics and also in combination with the government accountability and all, all of that. And what we've found is that we do not have any standard way in the state to collect racial and gender data. And so we've been talking about the need to expand this beyond just in the justice system, because we need to have a standard way of collecting data and analyzing racial and gender data in our healthcare systems, education, justice, economic development, housing, employment. We need to, and so our, one of the things we've been talking about is should this just be a bureau that looks at uh, racial statistics in the criminal justice system, or should it look at racial and gender statistics across our state so that we really have some sense of uh, what we're doing? Anyway, that's we, we've been talking a lot about that in many areas. And so I just, I just throw that out there. And we haven't taken talked at all about like where it should live or the organizational structure or anything like that. But but we need to have a broader sense of racial and gender statistics in the state. I, I don't necessarily disagree, Senator White, but I would point out that this bureau um, grew from the justice reinvestment effort. Right, I know that. Part of their problem in trying to um, look at how race um, and other factors were impacting our criminal and juvenile justice systems, we just didn't have the data. And so I, I, I think while I totally agree on getting all the data from all these different issues, I think doing something specifically within the criminal and juvenile justice system is extremely important. Um, <clears throat> just in order to you know, make the changes we need to make, I think we need uh, better data. We just, we, we don't know. I mean, that was embarrassing, almost embarrassing when the, when um, people from the Justice Center were saying, we can't really tell you why we have this number of uh, persons of color incarcerated in Vermont. Uh, we just can't tell you because the data is missing. I, I realized that, and I know that we're the Judiciary Committee, so that's where we're focused. But we are hearing the exact same thing in our healthcare system. We don't have the statistics. We don't know. We're hearing the same thing in our housing, employment, all of those systems. We just don't have the statistics. So wh what I'm suggesting is that maybe we think about if we're going really going to set up a bureau that we shouldn't, and we are the Judiciary Committee, so I understand that that's the focus here. But if you talk to the other committees, you'll hear the exact same thing. We had no idea in the pandemic about the, the um, impact on people of color or on women who had to leave the workforce. So anyway, it's just a suggestion. I'm just throwing it out and we're continuing to look at um, how we might um, address this whole issue in government operations. I'm just throwing it out. Uh, uh, if I may, uh... Both uh, Senator Sears uh, and uh, Senator, I think your points are very well taken. 
and if you look at the uh, the mind map as 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 uh, silly as it might seem sometimes, um, all of those things were taken into account, and uh, because of the nature of some of the other work that I do, both of your comments are very well taken. But in order to at looking at it from a data perspective. And I think uh, as we take more testimony along the way, uh, it's, there are some very uh, big uh, infrastructure questions that come into play uh, when you look at those pieces. Yeah. But I think as far as influencing our work, uh, as the legislature from a policy uh, position, if we can establish a template that works within this system, it will be the model that could be utilized to grow the data infrastructure for the rest of the system. Because one of the things that we know is, is that when we look at the disparities, and we've come to find out how interconnected they all are. The best quote I heard was, it's the air we breathe. So it in, it's influenced everywhere. Uh, economics, housing, education, as you stated, uh, every facet, you know, of our work, you know, here in the state, and it's impacted in every single area. But if, if we can come up with a system where we have a lot of the same players, which is interesting. If you look at our enabling legislation for RDAP, uh, the Agency of Human Services, which is one of the biggest agencies and comprises a lot of those, those categories that you mentioned, is part of this the jurisdiction of education and housing is covered through the Human Rights Commission. Those are the affected communities. So when you deal with the disparities and you're looking at data that's disparaging to any of the, any of the affected classes, the commission has that jurisdiction. So we actually have built a structure that could allow us to design that next step by moving forward as we as we do our work here uh, so I, I th that that was just an observation uh, because they've been doing some work with GAC you know in uh, another part of our life and then you know, looking at those other disparities. Uh, so uh, I, I agree, you know, th those are concerns, but I think getting started uh, here might be a very good vehicle for us to move forward. Thanks. And coach, I'm gonna keep the, uh, have you keep holding the baton and, and oh. uh, <laughs> keep. Well, I, I guess, I guess at, at, at this point, um, we did invite, uh, and this is still a conversation. This isn't, you know, let's say taking, um, you know, testimony, uh, which we will be doing. Uh, uh, actual testimony, uh, being that we had uh, both committees together, it seemed to make sense to have, you know, you know to vary from our normal procedure. Uh, every once in a while, that's not a bad thing to do. Uh, so we do have um, the chair of our DAP with us, and we have a number of members of our DAP uh, that have joined us as well, um, uh, just to kind of share uh, some thinking around uh, this different 
perspective. Um, so I guess my thought would be to start with uh, uh, Dr. Nesrat Lingo, uh, and we will go from there. Can we get Eric um, to take down yeah, the but, shared so yes. we can see people? Yeah. Yeah. I might add that Senate Judiciary is going to have to leave in about five minutes. And I yes. see Senator yeah. Benning's hand is moving. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard when the screen. Yeah. Senator Benning. Can I just ask Eric a question? I understood in the lead off to the discussion that the Bureau was coming out from underneath the wing of the executive branch. To what branch does this Bureau become responsible? What am I missing? This is the first time I'm seeing it and I, I'm I guess I'm trying to be clear on what branch, other than the Bureau having to issue reports to certain elements, what branch of government actually controls this Bureau? It's within RDAP. RDAP does the hiring. RDAP does the uh, oversight of the Bureau, the, the uh, management and authority is rests with, within RDAP over the Bureau. And I believe RDAP itself, I think, is, is within the Attorney General's office. Uh, giving it a certain amount of uh, uh, independence to a degree. I'm just trying to play out in my own head. I'm not asking out of ignorance because I just don't know. Is there another entity that is positioned in a similar way? I think there's a variety of of different models throughout state government. So, uh, you know, for example, the uh, the restitution unit of the Center for Crime Victim Services reports to reports to them, and that they're oversee they have oversight by the Victims Compensation Board. Um, you know, there, there's a variety of different models that um, are used for different different entities. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I think what it'd be best if Senate Judiciary left now so we don't leave in the middle of somebody's um, uh, testimony and I don't want to insult anyone. And uh, we will pick up here, I thank uh, the chair and uh, Coach Christie very much for the presentation and really helpful uh, so that as soon as the House passes this, we'll be able to start taking some action on our own. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you us. very much. Thank you. Yes. I'm just adding that I have to leave as well. So any other questions, though, let me know. Follow up, please. Absolutely. Thanks, thank Eric. You. Yeah, thank you, you Eric.